Hi, Ryan here with Access New England. In this video, we'll take a look at the Copley StepNet, a highly versatile and feature-rich stepper motor amplifier. The StepNet can take commands from various methods, including analog command signals, step and direction input, ASCII, and CAN open. However, thanks to a built-in indexer, it can also utilize internal motion programming to act as a fully functional single or multi-axis solution. Another valuable feature of the StepNet is its servo mode, which allows steppers fitted with encoders to be operated as brushless servo motors in current, velocity, or position mode. This takes away much of the traditional pain associated with using stepper motors at high RPMs. These features combine with CME2, Copley's easy-to-use programming and configuration software, make the StepNet a powerful motion control tool. Let's take a look at what it takes to get a StepNet panel working out of the box with a stepper motor. Here's the equipment that we use throughout this video. We'll need a StepNet and a Copley serial cable kit for communications along with a stepper motor. Additionally, we'll need an RS-232 COM port or USB adapter. I also have a 48 volt power supply for the StepNet and a PC with Copley's CME2 software installed. You can download it for free at copleycontrols.com forward slash motion forward slash downloads. Let's take a minute to go over the StepNet hardware, starting with J1 power. There are four connections in the J1 connector. Starting with pin 4, we have motor and logic ground or common, which should be tied to the common of the main DC supply, as well as an auxiliary supply if necessary. Pin 3 is the high voltage input which powers a stepper motor. It must not exceed the amplifier's maximum voltage rating. Pin 2 is the auxiliary power supply voltage input. It is used to power the device logic if the high voltage supply is disconnected or disabled. And pin 1 should be connected to earth ground. J2, motor. On the motor connector, there are five connections. Pin 1 is earth ground then pins 2 through 5 are for the motor phase connections. J3, signal. J3 is a 26 position high density D sub connector which contains the step nets 12 digital inputs and 4 outputs as well as inputs for an incremental encoder. J4, RS-232. J4 contains an RJ11 style connection for an RS-232 serial communications cable. J5 and J6 our connections for the CAN bus for CAN open protocol. Now we'll connect a DC supply up to 75 volts to the step net. In our case I'm using a 48 volt supply. At this point we can plug the AC side of the power supply in which will provide power to the step net. It's important that we don't connect the motor at this point as we could damage it with an incorrect configuration. Now we can set up our RS-232 serial cable. We'll take the 9-pin D-sub connector provided and connect it to the RJ11 cable. Now we'll take the other end of the cable and connect it to the J4 RS-232 input on the step net. Now we'll take the remaining end of the serial cable and connect it into our COM port. This will look different depending on whether you're using a USB to RS-232 adapter or if you're using a native COM port on a PC. The first thing we need to do on our computer is determine the COM port of our RS-232 communication. On XP, go to Start, then Run, then enter devmgmt.msc. This will bring up the Device Manager, which lets you view all devices attached to your computer. If you scroll down to Ports, COM and LPT, and then hit the Expand button, you'll see a list of devices attached to the COM ports on your PC. Typically, if the COM port is a native built-in port, it'll appear as COM1 and so on. If you have a USB to RS-232 adapter, it may show up as the name of the device, with its corresponding COM port in parentheses. Make a note of which COM port you have the StepNet RS-232 connected into. In this case, I have the StepNet connected to the COM2 port of my RS-232 adapter. Now we can open the CME2 software package. We'll hit OK on the pop-up window. 
And when the software opens up, it's going to warn us if there are any communications errors. We'll then go to Tools, Communications Wizard, and select Serial Ports as the device type. Hit Next. The Communications Wizard will show a list of available COM ports on your PC. Find the COM port that corresponds to the one you found in Device Manager. Select it and hit Add. In our case, our COM port was COM2, so we'll hit Add. This will add the COM port to the list of communication ports that CME2 will scan on startup to look for any attached Copley drives. We can leave the baud rate at the default of 115200 and hit Finish. CME2 will begin to scan the list of COM ports for available Copley drives. If you receive a communications error stating that CME2 could not connect to an amplifier on COM X, then you'll need to go back and check a few things. If your communications aren't working, check the tips on this list. If CME2 does successfully detect a drive on the COM port, you'll see it listed under the Copley neighborhood. Click on this and it'll upload the data from the drive into CME2. The first step is basic drive configuration. This will be the first prompt on a brand new device, but if it's a drive with an existing setup on it, you'll need to click the basic setup icon in the upper left hand corner. Hit change settings. For motor options, we'll select rotary, and then hit next. For feedback options, we would select an encoder if we had one, but we don't, so we're going to select none, and then hit next. We'll leave the operating mode options as the default for now, but you can select the method that corresponds to your application later. Click finish, and the settings will be saved to the amplifier flash memory. Our next step is to set up the motor feedback configuration. Click Motor Feedback. A screen will display showing the various electrical and mechanical properties that you'll need to fill in to configure your motor. First enter the manufacturer and model number of the motor you're using, then select whether the units will be given in metric or English. Enter motor inertia, resistance, inductance, rated torque, rated current, basic step angle, and desired micro steps per rev. Since we don't have an encoder, the Feedback tab is grayed out. This would be a good time to save the motor file to disk, then hit OK. At this point, the drive should be fully configured to test run the motor. One additional change we need to make is to ensure that our I.O. is configured so that the drive is hardware enabled by default. This is only for testing purposes, so in a normal scenario, you'd have another circuit wired into input 1 to control whether the drive is enabled or not. We need to click on the Input Output button on the CME2 main screen, which brings up a window displaying our various I.O. settings. IN1 is our Enable input, so we can select the Pull Up plus 5 volts on the left hand side, then select Amp Enable High, Enables with Clear Fault. This will cause the amplifier to be hardware enabled when Input 1 sees a voltage between plus 5 and plus 24 volts DC. Since we've manually set the input up, to be pulled up to plus 5 volts, the amplifier will be hardware enabled throughout the testing process. I've gone ahead and saved the amplifier data to disk, which is a good idea for you too. And I can also save the amplifier data to the flash memory in the drive. Okay, so I mentioned before that we didn't want to connect our motor until we were fully configured, which we are now. Provided we make sure that the amp is disabled, we can go ahead and connect the motor which I have, which is attached to a small precision stage. The motor has been connectorized for the J2 motor output of the drive. Now we can click on the control panel icon in the upper left hand corner of CME2. This will allow us to enable and test jog the motor. When you click enable, you should see the virtual LEDs for motor output and software enabled go green. This will confirm that your drive is enabled. Since the drive is enabled, I can click the Enable Jog checkbox in the Move section. This allows me to access the Move Positive and Move Negative Jog buttons, as well as change the velocity and acceleration and deceleration of the move. 
Now if I click Move Negative, my motor moves the stage in the negative direction. Same with Move Positive. Now that I've confirmed my motor setup and wiring is good, I'm free to get my control scheme up and running. Look for an upcoming video on how to write and organize a basic single axis motion program with the StepNet. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please send us an email and be sure to visit us on the web at axisne.com.